To, under to understand Claire Cheneau, you have to trace his roots to the backwoods of northeast Louisiana. The Cheneau house was a few miles south of Gilbert, a town of just a few hundred people. Raised up several feet to protect it from the floods that plagued the flatlands, the house was a small, single-story cottage with gingerbread trim and an inviting porch in the back. It was a modest abode, but it was the pride of John Cheneau, Claire's father, a cotton farmer who had built the house with his own hands in 1905 when Claire was a boy. Claire Cheneau would fondly recall roaming the oak woods and moss-draped cypress swamps of the Mississippi floodplains in northeast Louisiana. The Tensas River Basin was Cheneau's childhood playground. He spent time hunting and fishing by himself in the swamps. As he grew older, his father would let him go on treks for days at a time. Claire would take a fishing rod and survive on whatever he could catch, frying catfish and bream with a slab of bacon. He would live in a lean-to he built out of tree branches and sleep on a pile of leaves, and when he wanted to bathe would jump in a watering hole. He shot his first gun, a Winchester rifle, at the age of eight, and soon graduated to shooting squirrels. He learned how to build a pyramid trap, a box that was held up by a twig with some oat or cornflakes as bait. He became self-reliant during this idyllic childhood, which resembled that of the hero of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, one of his favourite books. His solitary adventures in the woods, however, may have masked a darker side of his childhood. His mother died when he was only five, and a stepmother he loved passed away a few years later. The woods were always there for him. Cheneau also had a vivid imagination that drew him to distant lands, and he dreamt of some day seeing more of the world. Although he didn't excel at school, he didn't like following instructions or sitting still, he found a collection of books at his grandfather's house about the ancient Greek and Roman wars, and would spend hours transfixed by reading them. He recalled, Although I had no idea where Greece, Carthage and Rome were, I was enthralled by the charging elephants, armoured warriors and burning ships in the coloured engravings of the battles of Thermopylae, Zama, Cannae and Salamis. He wanted to escape from his seemingly inevitable fate as a cotton farmer like his father, and instead become a soldier. In fact, he came from a long line of fighting men. He could trace his paternal lineage to a soldier who had fought in the American Revolution, his mother was a direct descendant of General Robert E. Lee. In 1909, Chenault enrolled at Louisiana State University to study agriculture, the only course that was open to him based on his primary education, but quickly signed up for Reserve Officers Training Corps training. He was determined to live up to what was expected of him as a soldier. When he was ordered to stand guard over a stairway, marching back and forth with a bayoneted rifle in hand, Upperclassmen poured buckets of water on him from the floor above, but as he later recalled, I continued to walk my post, drenched to the skin. Whatever merit he may have had as a soldier, he quickly found that he couldn't keep up academically due to his limited primary education. He also found that despite his efforts, he struggled with attending to the minute details that characterised life as a cadet. He racked up 40 demerits in just one month. During a dress inspection, he was caught with his trouser legs rolled up, which was against regulations. An officer yanked him front and centre and yelled in his face, Chenault, you will never make a soldier. The experience scarred Chenault, who came to feel that perhaps his lot in life was to be a cotton farmer after all. Over a break, he returned home to fish, a source of comfort since his youth, and never returned to Louisiana State. He dreaded what the future might hold. He knew cotton farming would mean trying to eke a living in a losing battle against palmetto root, bad weather, fluctuating prices, and the passing years. He'd seen the toll that life had taken on his father. The low price of cotton during the financial panic of 1907 had nearly wiped out the family's small farm, and an infestation of boll weevils could destroy an entire year's crop. The future seemed very dull indeed, Chenot recalled and though he was looking for bright new worlds to conquer, he couldn't seem to find in what direction they lay, that all would change on one Sunday afternoon at the State Fair. The fifth annual Louisiana State Fair was held in Shreveport in November 1910. It was primarily a celebration of the state's agricultural traditions, with prizes awarded for the best crops and livestock, but it also featured horse races, tightrope walkers, and concerts by a military band.
At eight o'clock each night, a thousand dollars worth of fireworks lit up the skies, a spectacular performance set to the music of the last days of Pompeii. The fair was a place where Louisianans could gather to take pride in the state's history, but it also offered them a glimpse of the future with a display of some new technology. The big attraction in 1910 was a biplane. Less than seven years after the Wright brothers' achievement at Kitty Hawk, few Americans had actually seen a plane in flight. The local papers promoted the event, promising that the pilots would astonish the people who visit the fair by their daring skill in the air. The main pilot, Stanley Vaughan of Ohio, had designed his plane himself, modelling it after one constructed by Curtis. On November 3, the second day of the fair, his biplane ascended, but as it rose fifty feet above the field, it suddenly plummeted to the earth, just like a duck suddenly shot, as the Shreveport Times described it. After the plane hit the ground, the stunned crowd ran toward it, but Vaughan stepped out of the plane without a scratch, though he had received quite a jar from the fall. He vowed that he would fly again and his machine would be ready. His next performance would be on Sunday, November 6th. Sunday was a big day at the Shreveport State Fair, the New Orleans Times Democrat reported. There were thousands in attendance, coming from all over Louisiana, as well as neighbouring Texas and Arkansas. Claire Cheneau had travelled 150 miles from Gilbert. The Shreveport Times reported that the sky was perfectly clear, and it was just cool enough to make the exertion of sightseeing a pleasure. As the sun began to set, Chenault and the other spectators crowded into the stands. From the tent at the edge of the field, the whir of the engine on the airplane was heard, and the people soon saw the slim lines of the heavier-than-air machine roll out of the tent and make for the centre of the racecourse. As the craft began to roll, eyes were strained through the dusk to see the machine, and soon outlined against the sky lighted by the setting sun, the machine arose like a mighty bird and started to climb. After flying for a quarter mile, however, Vaughan experienced engine trouble and brought the plane down, crashing through the racecourse fence. Once again he walked away unharmed. Still, the crowd considered the flight a success. The plane had gotten off the ground. For Claire Cheneau, witnessing the plane gliding overhead, even for just a few moments, was a revelation. He now saw a new frontier that sowed the seed of my desire to fly, one that would shape the rest of his life. His urge was intense and immediate, but years would pass before he got his first chance to take to the sky. Chenault was studying at Louisiana State Normal, and when he finished, set out on a new course, he was going to become a teacher. He got a lucky break when his uncle, a respected teacher in the area, helped him get a job teaching at the one-room country schoolhouse in Athens, Louisiana. Chenault was warned that he might have to raise a fist to keep discipline among the older students in his classroom. Legend has it that on his first day of teaching he was writing on the blackboard when he felt something hit him in the back. He turned around and demanded to know which of the students had thrown an eraser at him. A boy the size of a man stood up. Chenault dismissed the class and invited the perpetrator out back where he beat the daylights out of him. That was the end of the disciplinary problem at the Athens school. Teaching was rewarding, but Cheneau couldn't envision himself spending years tending to the annual crop of oversized farm boys who made the life of a teacher miserable and had cut the average tenure to less than a term. At the conclusion of the 1910 school year, Cheneau's uncle, a principal at another school, invited him to come watch the graduation ceremony. It was just like any other graduation, with the girls and boys in their best clothes, with the decorated rostrum, the school choir singing hymns, and the address of welcome by the best scholar. That address was delivered by a graduating senior, Nell Thompson, and Chenol was captivated by the stunning brunette. That one glimpse of beauty seared him, and he began to court her. A biographer noted that Chenol was impressed by her independence, her lively curiosity, her quiet strength, and her cheerful spunk. Even though they were both only eighteen, he and Nell were wed on Christmas Eve in 1911 and settled into married life. The routine didn't cure his desire to do bigger things with his life, but that desire was superseded by the need to support a family. He and Nell had their first son, John Stephen, in 1913, and their second, Max, the next year. His growing family convinced Cheneau that he had to leave Gilbert and finally take his chance to make his mark on the world. 
The Cheneaux moved to New Orleans, the largest city in the South, where Claire Cheneaux earned a diploma in typing, the sort of degree that could set him up for an office job. On the side, he was working as the athletic director at the local Young Men's Christian Association. The physical culture movement, a fairly novel belief that men needed to be concerned with fitness and to go to the gymnasium to exercise, was sweeping the nation. That was the work that seemed to excite Cheneau, and he would take jobs in a series of young men's Christian associations in Ohio and Kentucky, and eventually would become the director of the Young Men's Christian Association in Louisville. He embraced the virtues of physical rigour and was proud of his own strength. But working at the Y didn't pay well, even as a director. He knew he'd need something more to support his loved ones. In 1916, he took the train to Akron, Ohio. He showed up with a few suitcases and a trunk, one of thousands of men who poured into America's fastest-growing city looking for work. He rented the attic of a house for five dollars a week, then his family followed. It wasn't much, but Cheneau finally found a rewarding line of work. Every morning, he'd get up and ride the trolley to the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company factory. Goodyear was known for their tyres, helping to put Henry Ford's Model T's on the road, but in 1917 the company was hired by the United States Navy to make blimp-like balloons that could be used to spot U-boats along the coast. Cheneau signed on as an inspector on the balloon production line, a small step closer to his dream of flying. With his salary, the family was able to upgrade to a full house, paying $15 a week rent. It was a comfortable life. He liked the work, and Nell could stay at home with their kids. Chanel might have followed that path for years. But on May 7, 1917, a German U-boat sank the Lusitania, killing 1,198 civilians, including 128 Americans. America entered the Great War. Even though it would mean leaving his family, Chanel felt that he had to prove to himself that he could make it as a soldier. The army had sent out a request for pilots, particularly men who could operate the observation balloons that Cheneau was making at Goodyear. Applicants had to be between 19 and 25 years old, and the 23-year-old Cheneau was confident that he'd finally get his chance to fly. But the army was looking for a certain type of man to become a pilot, one who was energetic and forceful and of good moral character and clean habits, as a newspaper described the ideal candidate. It said, too, that he must have a good education. Hiram Bingham, a Yale professor and an explorer who had rediscovered Machu Picchu, was in charge of recruitment. In his view, a pilot should be an officer and a gentleman. He must be the kind of man whose honour is never left out of consideration. He must be resourceful, keen, quick and determined. Unsurprisingly, the army believed that Ivy Leaguers made the best pilots, especially polo players and quarterbacks. Few Americans in 1917 had flown in a plane, and the army concentrated on finding the best and the brightest from the flying clubs on Ivy League campuses to serve as America's pilots in the Great War. A factory worker like Cheneau didn't stand a chance. He received a cruelly blunt rejection letter that he'd remember for the rest of his life. Applicant does not possess necessary qualifications for a successful aviator. The army believed men like Cheneau, common men, were needed for the infantry, and he accepted the job he was offered. He reported for basic training at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana, one of the newly established bases where the army was turning civilians into newly commissioned officers. He spent three months there, making him one of the 90-day wonders that filled the army's burgeoning ranks. Though he was an infantry officer, fate showed its hand when he was ordered to a base in Texas connected to Kelly Field, where the army was training its new pilots. Cheneau spent his days drilling new infantry soldiers, but would visit the field where the planes were taking off, drawn by the roar of their motors, the harsh thrashing of their propellers and the strange rattle they made as they flew, as biographer Keith Ayling wrote. He desperately wanted to fly. He eventually finagled from one of the flight officers an unauthorised lesson in the Jenny, a two-seater with a place in front for the instructor and one behind for the student. As the Jenny jolted into the air, shaking like a kite in the wind, Chanel could see the white tents in neat rows at Kelly Field and the open Texas landscape that spread to the horizon. Seven years from when he'd first seen that plane take off at the state fair, he was finally flying. Soon he was even trying his hand at soloing. The instructors, impressed with Chanel's drive to learn, 
or maybe just worn down by his persistence, would taxi to the flight line, then climb out as Cheneau jumped in and took off. In total, he estimated that he accrued 80 hours of bootleg flying time. But in the Army's books, he was still an infantryman. Cheneau's unit was getting ready to deploy to France in the fall of 1918, but they only made it as far as Mitchell Field in New York before they were told that there would be no trip overseas. The German surrender was expected imminently. Cheneau had missed his chance to fight in the Great War. His unit was ordered to Langley Field in Virginia to work on a ditch-digging project. While he was on a troop transport, he caught the Spanish flu, a deadly disease that was spreading rapidly, brought by troops returning from Europe. Cheneau was quarantined in an aircraft hangar. The flu hit me hard. I was hauled away one afternoon to a small outbuilding where the dying spent their last hours. The officer next to me died early in the evening. Barely conscious, he could hear a doctor and nurse discussing his prognosis. He isn't dead yet, the nurse said. He will be before morning, the doctor replied. Someone slipped him a quart of bourbon, hoping to ease his final hours. But by morning he was still breathing and clutching the bottle in his hand. Cheneau would have lasting respiratory problems that he traced back to this episode, but he always believed he had been spared for some reason. He came to believe that God had something planned for him, and that there was some great mission that would guide his life. When the armistice was declared on November 11th, 1918, he was on a train going back to Kelly Field, determined to become a pilot. After his recovery, he applied again, and his perseverance paid off. His orders for flight training came through. With his hours of flight experience, Cheneau was impatient with the slow pace of the formal training. His instructor didn't appreciate his attitude and recommended that Cheneau be washed out. He had one last chance to stay flying, and that was to sufficiently impress a senior instructor in what might be his final flight. Not only did Cheneau redeem himself, but the instructor, Ernest Allison, recognised something special in him. Allison took him in hand and taught him acrobatic flying, daredevil stunts that pushed the limit of the airplane. Cheneau learned how to flip the craft upside down, hanging tight against the safety belt. He loved the kaleidoscope of sky and earth as the plane turned upside down. This unrestrained brand of flight hooked him, he said, like a tensus river base on a minnow-covered barb. From then on, I had the taste of flying in my craw and could not get it out. Chenault finally obtained a permanent commission in the air service in 1920 and was assigned to the 12th Observation Squadron in El Paso, Texas, in 1921. He flew unarmed planes over the deep canyons of the Big Bend district, a sort of aerial border patrol. The work wasn't exciting, but he was accruing valuable hours in the cockpit and gaining greater confidence in his skills as a pilot. He brought his family with him to El Paso, and Nell gave birth to their sixth child, David. It was a happy time for them. We were a very close family in the early years, Chenault's daughter Peggy recalled. He made time to be with us. We had bridge sessions every night. As he grew into a more mature pilot, Chenault came to see the potential for using his aerial stunts as a type of entertainment. He hadn't grown up with much exposure to theatre, but he intuitively understood how to create a good performance. On Washington's birthday in 1923, Chenault's squadron put on a public display in El Paso. During the first part of the show, Chenault remained in the stands, wearing a long wig and Nell's coat and shoes. At one point in the programme, the announcer called for the oldest woman in the crowd to come down and ride in the airplane. Grandma Morris walked onto the field. This woman, the announcer told the crowd, was so old that she remembered travelling in a covered wagon. Now she would get to experience flight. As Grandma made her way into the cockpit, the pilot climbed out to check on the engine. Suddenly, the plane darted forward with the helpless old woman holding the stick. Spectators gasped as the runaway plane rose into the air, narrowly missing trees, hangars, a witness recalled. For the next 15 minutes, Grandma kept the crowd mesmerised as she circled overhead, performing impossible loops, banks, dives. And then, to the shock of the crowd, the plane landed perfectly, and jumping from the plane, Cheneau removed his wig and revealed the ruse. Cheneau was undergoing a transformation, he had been born a southerner, but was now acquiring a more global perspective. After the stint at Fort Bliss, he transferred to Hawaii, 
where he was stationed at Luke Field on Ford Island, right next to Pearl Harbor. He was like a boy with his first love, he'd later write, as he took his biplane out over the Pacific Ocean. He was put in command of the 19th Fighter Squadron, the Fighting Cox, and taught his squadron how to fly their MB-3 biplanes in a coordinated attack when they took on the enemy. Under the Pacific sun, his body was growing lean, tanned and hard, he recalled in his memoir. With his wing-tipped moustache and his white dress uniform, he was in the best fighter pilot tradition. By 1932, now one of the Army's more experienced pilots, he was assigned to Maxwell Field in Alabama. He was to serve as an instructor in the Air Corps Tactical School, a job that reflected Cheneau's growing reputation. But the commander had another idea. Would Cheneau help start the Army's first flying acrobatic team? The plan was to establish a performing troop that would travel to the country's air shows, serving as a sort of public relations team for Army flyers. Cheneau eagerly took on the task, assembling a three-person team that became known as the Three Men on the Flying Trapeze, after the popular song. Chenault went through a number of wingmen, but would eventually settle on two, William Billy MacDonald and John Luke Williamson, whom he would learn to trust with his life. Our team was picked by the simple process of inviting all candidates to try to stick on my wing for 30 minutes of violent acrobatics. MacDonald and Williamson made the grade. The three men flew their Boeing P-12 biplanes in unison, only a few feet separating their wingtips, dipping and twirling as if they were one. Their ease in the air took a lot of practice, but all the practice in the world couldn't change a basic fact. Stunt flying was dangerous. Fatalities were not uncommon. By 1934, the flying trapeze had started to travel the country, and the act was a hit. Future Major General Haywood Hansel served with them for a time, they were greeted by newspapers like the Miami News as the outstanding thrill producers of all time in the aviation world. Girls would rush out from the crowd to have their pictures taken with the smiling pilots. Newsmen from Fox, Universal, Hearst and Paramount filmed them in action. They even got a sponsor, and Cheneau became a pitchman. You will find that all flyers use gum, and I consider Wrigley's the best. At the time, air races were major sporting spectacles. Mired in the depths of the Great Depression, Americans were turning their eyes heavenward, looking to these soaring planes to imagine a better future for their country. Perhaps someday everyone could fly. It is true that aviation hasn't reached the stage where the farmer going to town with a basket of eggs can get a lift from a passing airplane, but possibly this will come in the future was a typical take in popular aviation. There were so many shows for Cheneau that the extraordinary became routine, but an appearance the three men on the flying trapeze made in Miami would shape the contours of Chenault's life for years to come. The seventh annual Miami Air Races in January 1935 marked one of the largest gatherings of airplanes in American history up to that time, with 500 planes expected to converge on Miami from across the nation. Thousands of Miamians paid 60 cents for a chance to see the nation's best pilots push the limits of what could be done in a plane. This was advertised as the thrills of a lifetime crowded into three short afternoons. Crowds at the municipal airport reached over 7,500 people. The British and German authoritarian Air Force attaches made the trip from Washington, D.C. to see the latest developments in aviation, and a contingent of Chinese officers scouting out new planes were in the stands as well. There would be parachutists, demonstrations of bomb dropping, using sacks of flour, and races featuring an array of different styles of planes. But no attraction was more anticipated by the crowd than the three men on the flying trapeze. As they'd practiced countless times before, the three pilots began to twist and turn together. They were in so tight a formation during the performance that from the ground the wingtips seemed to overlap, the New York Times reported. The planes did wing-overs and spins with a perfection that seemed as if the three planes were controlled by one mind. After the death-defying stunts, Cheneau walked to the announcer's podium to receive an award for acrobatic flying. It featured a plane mounted on top of a globe, a fitting prize for a man who had come to believe that planes would control the future of the world. Cheneau felt he was finally being recognised for the talents in the cockpit he'd spent years perfecting. When businessman William Pawley extended an invitation to his yacht to the three men, Chenault accepted, as Pawley was nothing short of the godfather of aviation in Miami. 
He'd established the city's routes to Central America and Cuba, and had developed a lucrative trade selling Curtis Wright planes to the Chinese. An adventurer who liked to make deals, Pawley would be described by his biographer as a cross between Indiana Jones and Donald Trump. He'd recently opened a factory in Hangzhou, modern-day Hangzhou, to assemble the planes from American-made parts. Now he was back from China with a small entourage from the Chinese Air Force, whom he wanted Chino to meet. When they gathered on the yacht, the leader of the group, Colonel P. T. Mao, must have impressed the Americans with his nearly perfect English. Mo had been travelling with his team to Russia, France, Germany, England and Italy, seeking to buy more planes for China and hire more pilots to train its air force. He believed that China, a young country in aviation, had much to learn from expert pilots in the West. He already had a number of former army pilots working as instructors at one of China's aviation academies, led by West Point graduate John Jouett, but he wanted more. When he met the three men on the flying trapeze, Mao quickly got to the point, telling Cheno and his team that they should come to China. Such an invitation wasn't unusual at the time. Lured by adventure and money, dozens of American pilots were flying under foreign flags. Pilots in the Lafayette Escadrille had fought for France in the Great War before America's entry. After the armistice, the Army Air Corps had been reduced in size, but many of its members were eager to take part in combat abroad. Some formed the Kosciuszko Squadron to help Poland in its struggle against the Soviet Union, while others joined the Cuban Air Force and the small air forces of South American republics. In 1928, Cheneau himself had received a tempting proposal to take his skills abroad, when, after viewing some drills, a visiting Soviet general had given Cheneau some vodka, chocolate and caviar as preliminary gifts to open a conversation about coming to advise the Red Army's new air force. Cheneau got them to agree to $1,000 a month, which was a steep raise over the $225 he was earning in the army, but he ultimately turned them down. However tempting Moe's offer might have been, Chenault, MacDonald and Williamson declined. Chenault had his job in the army and a large family to look after. He and Nell now had eight children. But Moe was not a man easily discouraged. The pilots remembered him saying, You will hear from me again. Back at Maxwell, Chenault focused on his teaching. He was one of the small cadre of instructors at the base charged with developing the army's air strategy. What kind of planes should they use in combat? What were the most successful tactics? It was an academic task, involving debates among the faculty and the drafting of long articles. Since 1911, when an Italian reconnaissance pilot decided to drop grenades on Turkish forces in Libya, aerial bombing had excited the imagination of military planners. By the 1930s, the prevailing view in the Army Air Corps was that bombers were the future of air power, as British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin famously put it, the bomber will always get through. Fighter planes, like the one Chenot flew in the flying trapeze, were judged to be useless against the overwhelming force of the bombers. Chenot dissented vehemently with this position, arguing that the fighter could control the skies. He didn't see his work with the flying trapeze as just a stunt. He thought of his aerial finesse as convincing proof that fighters could battle together through the most violent manoeuvres of combat and take down the bombers. This debate, waged in academic journals and in classrooms, wasn't just theoretical. It would determine how the Army Air Corps invested its budget and what tactics it would teach its pilots. Chenault's colleagues dismissed his ideas and came to resent him. It didn't help his cause that he was brash and arrogant about his opinions. He wrote strident articles and fired them off to senior army officers, who greeted them with stony indifference. Who is this damned fellow Cheneau? General Henry Arnold wrote after reading one of Claire Cheneau's papers. The personal battles within the tactical school began to wear on Cheneau, one historian noted. In addition to the emotional anguish of having his ideas rejected, his physical health was in decline. He smoked cigarettes by the pack, and crisscrossing the country to put on air shows had begun to take a toll on him. Flying in the open cockpit of his plane irritated his lungs. He was put on a diet of raw liver, which was supposed to help give him strength, but it didn't do much more than make mealtimes unpleasant. He was coughing uncontrollably, and when doctors diagnosed bronchitis, he was sent to the Army Navy Hospital in Hot Springs, Arkansas, to recuperate. 
Lying on a hospital bed in Hot Springs, Chenault wrote, There was ample time to look back over my 47 years and think about the future. Chenault was struggling with more than poor health. He felt stymied and belittled. When you're thwarted in every respect, you're just depressed, his oldest daughter Peggy would later recount. During his recovery, he received news that only confirmed his disillusionment with the army. His wingmen, MacDonald and Williamson, had been passed over for promotion. Cheneau had by then worked with the two men for years, and he took the army's decision as a personal rebuke. He wrote and urged them to take up the offer to go to China. Recognising that their army careers were limited, they decided to take his advice. William MacDonald, who had grown up in Birmingham, Alabama, was then 30 years old and about to embark on an adventure unlike anything he'd contemplated before. Luke Williamson was from South Carolina and was the kind of pilot who would earn his way into the South Carolina Aviation Association's Hall of Fame for taking an army plane and flying to his hometown. He would perform acrobatic stunts for the residents before landing the plane and going to see his family. This would be an adventure on a much grander scale. The flying trapeze pilots were joined on their journey east by a handful of other Americans who would be going to China to work with the Air Force, including Sebi Smith, an airplane mechanic who had helped the flying trapeze team. On July 11, 1936, this band of former army men boarded the Empress of Russia, a large steamer ship in Seattle, almost giddy with excitement about what lay ahead. On July 27th, they arrived in Shanghai, which was overwhelming beyond what they had imagined. It was, as Smith recalled, the busiest place any of us had ever seen. Throngs of Chinese and some foreigners bustled about the docks and embankment, mostly on foot, bicycle or rickshaw. Chinese officers escorted them to a tailor to have their Chinese uniforms fitted. They then headed southeast to the Central Aviation School at Hangchow and were housed at a luxurious hotel. From their new home, they could look out at the West Lake and on the weekends would have picnics by the water and hire boatmen to take them out for pleasure cruises. They would go into town to see somewhat out-of-date American movies at a small theatre that had a Chinese interpreter who stood next to the projector and explained the plots in Chinese. They bought bicycles to explore the area and found a Buddhist temple deep in a bamboo forest that they liked to visit. The work itself was rewarding for the pilots. They woke at 6.15am each morning and, with the help of interpreters, taught tactics to the Chinese recruits until 6.30pm. They were pleased with the progress the new pilots were making. After a few months, they were ready to graduate a class, and the ceremony was as festive as a 4th of July celebration. The Americans were guests of honour, invited to sit on the reviewing stand with Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek and his wife, Madame Chiang. The Curtis biplanes roared overhead in formations of three, and the successive flybys of so many new aircraft were an inspiring sight for everyone. As if to underscore that the men had been trained for a potential war, targets had been placed on the ground, and the ships came roaring down past us with their machine guns blazing away. The graduation festivities lasted all day and culminated with a spectacular fireworks display. In December 1936, one of the senior American aviation instructors died of a heart attack just before he was to conduct a comprehensive survey of the Chinese Air Force. Madame Chiang, who spoke fluent English with a southern drawl acquired during her years studying at schools in Georgia, was at the funeral. She asked the American pilots whether there was a suitable pilot back in the United States who could come to China to replace him. They told her they knew the perfect candidate, Claire Cheneau. At her instruction, they wrote him a letter with an invitation to come to China. This time, Chenot would not refuse. Chenot's career in the army had stalled. He likely faced a future that would involve no flying, and he didn't want to just sit behind a desk. The letter asking him to go to China couldn't have come at a better time. This wasn't just an offer to teach at the aviation school. He was being asked to do a survey of the Chinese Air Force and offer ideas about how to develop it in the years ahead. This was the recognition he wanted, not just as one of America's best pursuit pilots, but as a strategic thinker. The pay wasn't bad either at $1,000 a month for the three-month assignment. He would also be provided with a car, chauffeur and interpreter, and he could fly any plane in the Chinese Air Force that he wished. Sheno explained his decision to accept in a letter to his brother. When an old, well-ploughed road is blocked, a new path must be opened. 
His work in China, he speculated, may amount to very little except a good paying position, or it may amount to a great deal. He felt destiny calling in no small way. It is even possible that my feeble efforts may influence history for some few hundreds of years. China was not actively at war, but in 1931 Japan had invaded China and annexed Manchuria, and the status quo in the Far East was far from stable. Chenot understood his job with the Chinese would be to prepare them to whip hell out of Japan. For some time, Chenot had managed to balance his two great loves, flying and family, but this time Nell and the children, who had accompanied him from base to base, would remain in America. Despite the demands of his career, the Chenot had a happy marriage, and Nell supported his flying. She would sit on the front porch and watch the pilots fly down the Selma Road in front of her house, taking notes on improvements that were needed. After years of semi-nomadic existence, the family had finally settled in a large antebellum home a few miles outside of Birmingham, Alabama. The family played bridge together, and Cheneau taught his younger sons how to hunt and fish. He loved his children and his wife, but he felt that he was stuck in an eddy and being sucked under. China looked to him like a life royal air force. Nell opposed the whole idea and worried about the impact on the children, but she couldn't control her husband and besides, they had always been short of money and there were still young children they needed to feed and someday send to college. If he took on this mission in China, their financial problems could be addressed and Claire assured Nell that he wouldn't be gone long. Still, his family never believed this had been about the money. His daughter Peggy would later say that her father left because he wanted to prove his theories. While Chenault explained the job as a three-month assignment, one historian suggests that he already knew he was signing up for a longer two-year contract. Before he left, Chenault helped the family move to a farm in rural Louisiana. Nell had been born on a farm and he hoped that she'd feel at home there. The house was in a town called Waterproof, on the banks of Lake St. John. There was a porch out front and plenty of space in the back for Nell to grow a garden and raise chickens, as well as orchards of fruit and pecan trees nearby. Chenot handed in his army resignation in April 1937. The Shreveport Times took note, saying that the officer had been ill several months and that this was the reason for his retirement. In reality, Chenot felt invigorated by the mission that lay ahead. He had no second thoughts as he boarded a train on May 1st for San Francisco. I felt a compulsion to go, he would recall, that I couldn't resist. He began a diary to chronicle the great adventure. Claire Chenot was aboard the SS President Garfield as it set out from San Francisco on May 8th, 1937. The weather was rough, showers, wind and considerable sea. He had crossed these waters when he was stationed in Hawaii over a decade ago, but on this trip he no longer wore an army uniform. His new passport listed his occupation as farmer, a cover for his actual mission. In his stateroom he spent his time working on my plans and studies. He had a survey to conduct, but beyond the brief conversation he'd had with Colonel P.T. Mao two years earlier, and the letters that he'd received from his friends in China, he knew little about what awaited him. The voyage continues uneventfully, and time seemed to pass slowly. He found the passengers uniformly uninteresting, but he still joined them for games of bridge and table tennis. Tried to dance in the evening, but ship rolled too much, he wrote. When the ship docked in Honolulu, he stopped for a cocktail at the Alexander Young Hotel. His posting in Hawaii with his family had been one of the happier periods in his career, as he'd enjoyed the carefree pleasures of island living, but now he was just passing through. Before reaching China, the President Garfield would stop in Japan. Chenot knew he would have to maintain the fiction of being a farmer in the event of a police interrogation, as Japanese authorities had already lodged protests with the United States government about American pilots volunteering to serve with the Chinese. When the ship docked, the plan was for him to meet up with Billy MacDonald. The two men would tour the country, gathering whatever intelligence they could on the Japanese military. MacDonald, like Chenot, was understandably wary about entering Japan, essentially as a spy, and needed a cover story. He had been drinking at a bar in Shanghai that was popular with expats when he'd run into an old fraternity brother. It turned out that this man was the manager of a circus-like troupe, a group that MacDonald described as a mix of Russian singers, Chinese jugglers, 
and a trio from the Philippines called the Dixie Girls. The group was on the way to Japan for a few shows, and MacDonald's friend said he could come along, posing as their manager. The con worked, and he passed through customs without an issue. After hanging backstage at the troupe's performance, MacDonald slipped away to meet Cheneau. Cheneau arrived in Kobe at 10pm on May 27th. The following day, he and MacDonald rented an open-air car, and with cameras hidden beneath their top coats, drove around industrial districts booming with new factories. Cheneau filled a notebook with observations, and they took photographs. The duo then boarded the President Garfield and cruised down the Sato Inland Sea, where Japan's rapid industrialization was on impressive display. Cheneau made note of the bustling shipping lanes and islands with new factories. Industry seemed to be expanding, he recalled, with the suspicious speed of a military enterprise. Though China had hired him to prepare them for another war with Japan, he couldn't help but find the country very attractive and was captivated by its beautiful scenery. When the President Garfield pulled into the port of Shanghai on May 31, 1937, Chenol felt as if he were entering another world. Rickshaws darted along the docks, and though the humid heat was oppressive, this new land fascinated him. Because Shanghai was an international port city, the great powers shared control with the Chinese, and warships of many nationalities stood in the harbour, including British, French and even American. Luke Williamson was waiting for them at the dock. To celebrate Chanel's arrival, the Americans gathered for a welcome dinner at the Metropole Hotel in the heart of Shanghai's international settlement. They went up to the roof, where the weather was perfect that night for the affair, C.B. Smith wrote, and the dinner was grand. All guests seemed to have been able to satisfy their curiosity about the famous Claire Lee Chenot. At last I am in China, Chenot wrote in his diary where he confided that he hoped to be of service to a people who are struggling to attain national unity and new life. On the afternoon of June 3rd, Chenot was picked up in a car by Roy Holbrook. Holbrook was an American ex-army pilot who had worked on procuring new planes for the Chinese government. As they made their way through the city, Chenot saw the potholes in the street, remnants of the Japanese bombing of Shanghai in 1932. The car turned onto a wide tree-lined avenue in the French concession, a neighbourhood designed to mimic Paris, and stopped outside an imposing gate. The home with the Grand Garden was the residence of China's premier couple, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang. Chen Ao had come to meet with Madame Chiang to receive the details of his assignment. He took a seat in a dimly lit waiting area, following Holbrook's lead. Then suddenly a young girl, clad in a modish Paris frock, tipped into the room, bubbling with energy and enthusiasm. Chenot assumed she was one of Holbrook's friends and didn't greet her until Holbrook nudged him and said, Madame Chiang, may I present Colonel Chenot? Chenot had been expecting an older woman, and Madame Chiang looked younger even than her thirty-nine years. She introduced herself in flawless English. Sung Mei Ling had spent almost a decade living in the United States. Her father, Charlie Sung, was a wealthy businessman who wanted his children to be educated in America. In 1908, ten-year-old Sung Mei Ling was sent to Macon, Georgia, to live with her older sister, who was attending Wesleyan College. She came to consider herself a native. When a teacher asked her to explain Sherman's march across Georgia during the Civil War, she replied, Pardon me, I am a Southerner, and that subject is very painful to me. She also attended Wesleyan, but then transferred to Wellesley College in Massachusetts to be close to her brother, T.V. Sung, who was at Harvard. She majored in English and had a fairly routine life as a student, playing tennis and joining the art society, Tau Zeta Epsilon. After graduation and a tearful farewell to friends at Grand Central Station, she took a train to Vancouver and boarded a steamship back to China, a land she had known only as a young child but she was determined from a young age to play a role in shaping China's future, and after she returned, she met and fell in love with Chiang Kai-shek. He was a rising star in the nation's military, though many would claim that she loved power more than any man, and that her interest in him was due to the fact that he worked directly for Sun Yat-sen, the founder of modern China. It was an unlikely match. Chiang was more than a decade older than her and divorced with two sons, he was a Buddhist and she was a Christian. 
but they shared a love for China and a concern for their country's destiny. After he converted to Christianity, they were married on December 1, 1927. By then, Chiang had succeeded Sun to become nationalist China's leader, and Madame Chiang, as she came to be known, intended to play a major role in running the country. Though the Chiangs led nationalist China, the reality was that China remained quite fractured. There were warlords leading other factions that remained quasi-independent of the nationalist government. The Communist Party was led by Mao Zedong. Though Chiang and Mao had been able to forge a united front in 1936, their alliance was an uneasy one. The tensions would be submerged to face a common foe, but were bound to resurface eventually. Madame Chiang worked side by side with her husband in managing China's future and was considered the most powerful woman in the world. She wanted to unite China's factions and make it into a great power, viewing the United States as not only a model for China's development, but as an important ally. During one trip to the United States, she said, when we need a friend, we can always look toward our sister republic. She was all business in that first meeting with Chenot. As Secretary General of the Chinese Aeronautical Affairs Commission, she focused on building up China's air force. She was a fervent believer in air power, and she felt that the airplane could help stitch together the feuding fiefdoms that made up China. If the powerful Japanese military machine attacked again, she believed that it would be the Air Force rather than the Army that would be crucial to the nation's defence. But with so many of the Chinese air bases located far from Shanghai, she had little idea of what condition the Air Force was actually in. That's why she needed Cheno to travel to these remote outposts to gather information about the condition of the pilots and planes. This was the sort of assignment that Cheno had been eager to undertake, a high-level mission for which his opinion would be valued. He told her he'd have the survey completed within a few months. I reckon you and I will get along all right in building up your air force, Chenault reportedly said. I reckon so, Madame Chiang replied. Chenault, like so many others before and after, was smitten. That night he noted in his diary that Madame Chiang would always be a princess to me. He later wrote that the meeting was an encounter from which I never recovered. Chenault faced a tough task, for there was little reliable information about the status of the Chinese Air Force. By 1937, it had grown, on paper, to include over 600 aircraft that could be used in a war. In their rush to build their arsenal, the Chinese had imported a range of American and European planes. There were a number of different training schools, some run by American pilots and others by Italians, but the Air Force was primarily under the command of the latter after the Americans on the Jouet mission withdrew in 1935. There were Fiat planes on the runways, and near one airbase there was even a little Italy, complete with cafes like those in Rome. Despite the bravado of the Italian officers, Madame Chiang was concerned about their work, as they were apparently graduating every cadet, whatever their skill level. There were also rumours that many of the planes weren't airworthy, Cheno would spend several weeks flying a zigzag route across China inspecting bases. Accompanying him in his Douglas BT-2, a two-seater biplane widely used as a trainer, was C.B. Smith, and in a second plane were Billy MacDonald and their interpreter, Colonel P.Y. Shu. I had my hand on a throttle again for the first time since the Air Corps grounded me the previous autumn, Cheno wrote and it felt good to be in the air again with Billy on my wing and a broad, muddy river below that could easily have been the Mississippi instead of the Yangtze. But the great distance he had travelled from home became clear as he observed the countryside and realised that the brilliant green carpet below could come only from growing rice and the web of canals and black slate-roofed villages reminded us that it was really China below. As they made their first stops at Nanking and Nanchang, Cheno began to see the extent to which the Italians had been exaggerating the strength of the air force in their reports to the Chinese. In Nanking, General Silvio Scaroni, one of Italy's leading aces from the Great War, roared through the streets in a big black limousine, his uniform dripping medals and gold braid. Cheno was put off by the bombastic demeanour of the Italian pilots and was so unimpressed by the flying he saw that he was moved to write, the Italians did all they could to sabotage China. His most important stop was in Luoyang, modern-day Luoyang, a base in central China that the Italians had taken over from the Americans in 1935 and where they had established a major flight school. 
Getting there involved flying over vast empty stretches of land, and MacDonald wrote that he was glad we did not have motor trouble in that region. Cheneau quickly discovered that the roster of planes there had been wildly inflated by counting hulks of metal that would be worthless in battle. It was becoming clear that it would take years to build a truly modern air force for China. Am appalled by situation here and would go home if I did not want to serve China, he wrote in his diary on June 25, 1937. He had come to appreciate China's rich history, and he wanted to be part of shaping its future. While in Luoyang, he hiked through the mountains to see one of China's great wonders, the Longmen Grottoes, where intricate images of Buddha had been carved into the cliffs, some reaching over 50 feet tall. It is nothing to see something 2,000 years old here, MacDonald wrote to his parents. While Cheneau was in Luoyang, 500 miles to the northeast, a new round of conflict was taking shape between China and Japan. Ever since the Japanese had helped suppress the Boxer Rebellion, a native uprising against Western influence at the beginning of the 20th century, Japanese forces had been stationed in a garrison outside Peking, modern-day Beijing. On the evening of July 7th, the Japanese held an unannounced training mission, and in the darkness they traded fire with Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge. It took a couple of days for the news to reach Cheno, and it still was vague, but the Marco Polo Bridge incident marked the renewal of war between Japan and China. Cheno saw the fighting as a call to action. He believed that one should never run from a fight. For almost 20 years he had developed tactics for aerial combat, and now that war had been thrust upon him, he wanted a chance to give my ideas an acid test in combat. His opportunity to shape history was in the offing. He sent a telegram offering his assistance to the Chinese. The reply came from Chiang Kai-shek himself. Your voluntary offer of services gratefully accepted. Before reporting the dire condition of their air force to the Chiangs, Chen o returned to Nanchang to work with Colonel Mao. Nanchang's summer heat was, according to Chen o, like a Turkish bath, and the clouds of dust on the airfield left his challenged lungs gasping for air. He accompanied Mao to the airfield, but he was discouraged by what he saw. The Air Force, Chenault wrote in his diary, is terribly unprepared for war. In the evenings, he and Mao drank cold beer and ate watermelon as they discussed the long war ahead of them. The two men then travelled to Kuling, modern-day Guling, in the central part of the country, where the Chiangs spent the summer at a sprawling villa with a courtyard full of trees and flowers. The city was nestled at the top of Mount Lushan and was considered one of China's great resort towns. Chiang greeted them Western style, shaking their hands, Cheno recalled, and preliminaries dispensed with. The Generalissimo turned to Mo and in sharp staccato Chinese began to quiz him on the condition of the Air Force. Madame Chiang translated for Cheno. How many first-line planes are ready to fight? Chiang asked. Mao could only respond with the pathetic truth. Ninety-one, Your Excellency. Chiang turned red, went outside to the porch, and began to walk up and down the steps, shouting something Cheno could only guess the meaning of, his words seeming to coil and strike like a snake. Colonel Mao stood at attention, the terror visible in his eyes as he stared straight ahead while the colour drained from his face. The Generalissimo has threatened to execute him, Madame Chiang whispered to Cheno. We should have five hundred first-line planes ready to fight. Chiang, as one journalist wrote, had a shortness of temper that exhibited itself in bizarre ways. It wasn't out of the question that Cheno would bear the brunt of Chiang's fit of anger. As historian Hannah Pakula wrote, Chiang's temper was not always used against the deserving. Watching a movie in his home one evening and vastly annoyed by a particular scene, he stalked out of the room and ordered that the projectionist be thrashed. Chiang returned from his pacing and asked Cheno directly in Chinese, what does your survey show? Madame Chiang translated the question. With Madame Chiang translating, Cheno explained that those figures are correct. He went on to describe the sorry state of the Air Force. He waited for another tirade, but Chiang must have felt some degree of respect for his honesty. Cheno would later write that this was a pivotal moment in his relationship with the Chinese leader, because it laid the foundation of a reputation for absolute frankness. Chenault was invited to accompany the Chiangs to a war council in Nanking, where warlords from across the nation would gather. 
Many of these men had been feuding for years, but Chiang was intent on rallying them together for the common defence. Cheno was just an observer on the sidelines, but he saw history in the making. On August 13, during a meeting, a messenger entered the hall and passed a note to Chiang. He read it and handed it to his wife, who began to sob as she read it, and then explained to Cheno, They are shelling the Shanghai Civic Center. They are killing our people. They are killing our people. What will you do now? Cheno asked. Regaining her composure, she answered, We will fight. The Izumo, a Japanese cruiser, was anchored just a quarter mile from Shanghai and used its eight-inch and six-inch guns to attack the city. Madame Chiang wanted to strike back. When Chenault proposed the idea of launching a dive-bombing mission against the ship, she told him to organise it. Chenault wouldn't fly in the attack himself, but he would be responsible for organising it. He stayed up until 4 a.m. poring over maps and planning the missions. He would use a few Curtis Hawk dive bombers along with some Northrop light bombers to strike the Izumo with 1,100-pound bombs. Chenault felt the pressure of the moment. After 20 years of practicing for war, I was finally playing for keeps. The attack would require precision, but if it was successful, it would be a stunning victory that could shift the tide of the nascent war. There were already warning signs, however, that things weren't going to proceed according to plan. In his diary, MacDonald had complained of the Chinese pilots. One review, technique poor, dive shallow, aim bad. The next day, August 14, 1937, the sky over Shanghai was dark with rain clouds, conditions that would make flying more challenging, but Cheno gave the go-ahead for the mission. Three Chinese planes made their way toward the harbour. They had intended to fly at an altitude of 7,500 feet, but were forced by the storm as low as 1,500 feet to stay below the clouds and see where they were going. The Chinese attackers appeared over the cruiser with lightning suddenness, an Associated Press reporter wrote. They dove down and released their bombs, but missed their mark by the narrowest of margins. The bombs fell straight into the international settlement. The explosion was deafening, and the results were horrifying. I saw the streets littered with dead and dying, United Press correspondent John Morris wrote. The wounded were carried into the hotel, and the tile floors soon became slippery with blood. Acrid fumes from burning buildings and automobiles filled the air, and he could see fires shooting high into the air as tinder-dry buildings and houses burned. He described it as one of the most frightful holocausts ever inflicted on civilised people. The dead numbered over 800, with some estimates as high as 5,000. The Chinese would remember that terrible day as Bloody Saturday. If Cheneau needed any evidence of the cost of a poorly trained air force, he now had it in blood. The following day, Cheneau had lunch at the Metropolitan Hotel in Nanking with a few other Americans who had been involved with the flight school. They were all staying on the northern edge of town in a hotel that one account said might have been a boarding house in a second-rate American country resort. The rooms didn't have windows and were filled with mosquitoes that flew in from the pond. It was a hot summer day, the kind of weather that earned Nanking its reputation as one of the furnaces of China. As they were finishing their meal, they heard air raid sirens. Cheno rushed out into the garden and watched as a large formation of planes closed in. It was still inconceivable to me that people would be trying to wage war by dropping bombs on cities, C.B. Smith would recall. Sharp machine-gun reports were coming from everywhere. Bright shell bursts could be seen dotting the skies, and bombs started exploding. Cheneau ran toward a dugout and jumped in, not daring to lift his head, but hearing the cacophony of car horns, shouting and barking dogs as the bombs rained down across the city. He survived, but this was the beginning of a new phase in his relationship to aerial warfare. For years he had studied it, but now he was actually seeing the carnage up close. Nanking was undergoing a transformation to prepare for the war. But along with the sense of urgency came a dark foreboding. One man said he felt the city was making itself ready for a funeral on a large scale. The city had always had natural advantages when it came to defence. Water and mountain provided not only beauty for Nanking but military protection, historian Iris Chang observed of its geography, and a fifty-foot wall with a moat stretched around it. The hills were covered with a bristling ring of anti-aircraft guns, noted a newspaper account, 
and guns also dotted the rooftops of government buildings, the roofs themselves painted grey to make them harder to see from the sky. Gas masks had been distributed to the city's residents, who had dug holes in which they could take shelter during air raids. The Japanese planes came back day after day, their raids announced by wailing sirens and the angry crack of anti-aircraft guns in the distance. During each raid, the men could hear the engines of the incoming aircraft get louder and louder, as C.B. Smith recalled. The sound of whining and droning airplanes, the pop-pop-pop of machine guns and the thunder from the flashing bombs and anti-aircraft guns will make most anyone shudder and tremble. Nanking's residents sought shelter in the dugouts, plugging cotton in their ears to block out the pounding explosions of the bombs, but they had an inescapable feeling that they might be taking cover in their own graves. The clock ticks off the time which is often the last few precious minutes of many people's lives, Smith put it as they all wondered, who will it be this time? They waited dark eternities for the blast of the all-clear siren to signal that they could emerge from their hiding places. As the air raids continued, Chennault got to work setting up a defence for Nanking. The Air Force was terribly handicapped by a lack of equipment, he wrote in a letter, but he was determined to fight. He helped organise a warning net that consisted of a series of outposts in the hills around Nanking that were linked by radio and could provide an early warning of an impending attack. The Chinese Air Force in Nanking had only a few dozen Hawk 3 biplanes, an American-made craft that was bulky and designed along the lines of the planes from the Great War, and a handful of P-26 P-shooters, a sleeker monoplane made by Boeing. It wasn't much of an arsenal. But Cheneau had identified what he believed was a vulnerability in the Japanese attack plan. Japanese bombers were flying in from air bases in Japan and Formosa, present-day Taiwan, which meant they had travelled across vast expanses of water and land to reach their targets. Many of the planes flew an incredible 1,250 miles round trip. Cheneau knew that the Japanese were dispatching their bombers without fighter escorts, and though Japan's double-engine G-3M bombers were fast, they were vulnerable. If a few Chinese fighters could manage to surround one of the bombers and aim for its fuel tank, they could successfully bring it down. Cheneau had argued for years that fighter planes could defeat bombers. Now was his chance to prove it. He gave instructions to the Chinese pilots, hoping to teach them all the tricks I've learned in all the years I've flown. He suggested one particularly aggressive tactic, don't be afraid to ram them, C.B. Smith recalled him saying. The Japanese can't survive a collision of that kind. You might tear off a wing tip, but that would be the extent of your damage. When the Japanese bombers appeared, Chenault and MacDonald would stand outside and watch the skirmish with binoculars. MacDonald wrote about one battle in a letter he sent home. The Japanese has the upper hand, suddenly a swift manoeuvre, and the Japanese has the Chinese on his tail, round and round then. We see the Chinese plane draw close to the Japanese and then a little burst of smoke and straight down into the city. The Japanese plane hits the ground and bursts into flames, piling smoke almost as high as the Chinese plane that is victoriously circling his fallen foe. We cheer until we are hoarse. Another observer, Royal Leonard, a Texan pilot who flew for the Chiangs, recorded that during one attack the Chinese pilots swarmed over the Japanese bombers like bees. They got under the bellies of the bombers behind their tails and let go bursts of machine gun fire. Among the Chinese pilots was a group of Chinese Americans from Portland, Oregon, whose training the Chinese government had sponsored in a stateside aeronautical school. One of them, Arthur Chin, had also been sent to Germany for advanced training with the Luftwaffe. Chin scored his first kill in the opening days of the air battle over Nanking, but his real challenge came in a later contest when he found himself facing a Japanese squadron after he had run out of bullets. Chenol recalled how he observed Chin deliberately ram the Japanese leader as he came in for the kill. Both planes burst into flame, but Art hit the silk safely. When they found him, he was directing the salvage of the precious machine guns from his wrecked plane. Chin handed one of the weapons to Chenot and asked, Sir, can I have another airplane for my machine gun? The Japanese had clearly intended the steady bombardment to break Nanking's spirit, but when Shenou walked its streets he saw its people striding with purpose, determined to go on with their lives. 
He heard music playing on phonographs in people's homes and savoured the aromas wafting out of the wine shops, steaming noodle vendors and sticky sweet shops. China will not be cowed, no matter how much the air arm of the Japanese militarists may do, wrote the China press. Life went on. Chenault and MacDonald met for golf on the course behind the Nanking Country Club, played cribbage and frequented the shops downtown. They learned to live with the air raid sirens. During a rainy period in the fall of 1937, Nanking was shielded by clouds that kept the bombers at bay. Bad weather, MacDonald wrote in his diary. If only we could control this, we could certainly arrange for at least two weeks of this kind of weather. There were rumours that the Japanese would return after the weather cleared with an attack that may be the most terrible air raid the world has ever known, as one newspaper put it. This could blow Nanking, with its one million inhabitants, off the map. On the morning of September 25th, 1937, the sun appeared, and by 9am the sound of approaching planes was heard. A squadron of Chinese pilots took off to defend the city, but they were too late. It soon became clear that the attackers weren't aiming at military targets, but rather at civilians downtown. A pair of thousand-pound bombs just missed the hospital leaving 30-foot-wide holes on the tennis courts where they landed. Many more strikes were successful, and gallons of civilian blood flowed, a radio broadcaster reported. MacDonald wrote in his diary that China would fight to the last man. As the attacks continued, Chenault and MacDonald started each day with the same question, What time do you think the Japanese will come today? One morning, one of the Americans showed up to breakfast wrapped in a towel as he had soiled the only pair of pants he owned during a raid, and the servants were trying to clean them. Once Billy MacDonald was in the middle of getting a haircut when the alarm was sounded. Our visit to the shop was cut short, so was our hair. The Chinese Air Force could do little to halt the assaults. The American pilots talked about growing their own ranks. How wonderful it would be if we had a group of American-trained pilots to help fight in defence of China. At the time, the idea was so far-fetched that none of us thought it might ever come about, Smith recalled. The valiant efforts of Cheneau's small force were Pyrrhic victories at best. But the dream of American reinforcements became more fervent as fighter planes fell and casualties mounted. Only a few planes left to defend the city, MacDonald wrote in his diary. The lack of equipment and lack of experienced pilots made victory seem elusive, if not impossible. Chenot despaired that the Chinese Air Force was at the end of its rope. Madame Chiang spent most of her days in her office writing orders on her typewriter, but there was little she could do to affect the dire situation. She kept two machine guns from downed Japanese planes next to her desk as war prizes, and like Chenot would watch the battle unfold whenever there was an air raid. She was eager to see her beloved pilots and would regularly come down to the airfield. On one such occasion, she brewed tea for the airmen while she awaited their return from a raid and joined Cheneau on the runway as the planes appeared. The first pilot overshot and cracked up in a rice paddy. The next ground looped and burst into flame, Chenault wrote, and in total five out of eleven planes were wrecked and four pilots killed. Watching the chaos unfold, Madame Chiang shouted out, What can we do? What can we do? However much she prized her air force, she was well aware that it was incapable of defending Nanking. As Japanese troops neared the city, Chenault prepared to get into the cockpit himself. The American mechanics readied a special plane, the Hawk 75, especially for him. Unlike the older Hawk 3 biplanes, this was a sleek monoplane that could achieve incredible speeds. Chenault supplied some of his own personal touches. He stripped the plane of everything inessential to make it lighter and faster. He pulled out the radio, making a little cubby in which he could keep a bedroll, which could be useful if he was ever shot down over the wilderness. He took the Hawk 75 on long reconnaissance missions on which he spotted troop movements and checked enemy airdromes, which revealed that it wouldn't be long before the Japanese army would reach Nanking. At one point, Cheneau ordered his mechanic to get some guns on this ship and get them on in a hurry. Cheneau denied up until his dying days that he ever took part in combat missions during the defence of Nanking, which would seem to violate American law. Whether Cheneau's story was true or a judicious lie, only he could confirm. The mere possibility of an American pilot fighting for China had begun to cause problems. 
the Associated Press had run an article about Cheneau's trip to China, which had aroused speculation about its purpose, and now mystery surrounded his activities there. The United States consul in Shanghai, Clarence Gauss, sent a cable to the State Department saying that Colonel Cheneau, retired officer, United States Army Air Corps, is implicated in combat operations. Gauss was a foreign service officer who had spent his career in China, and he was carefully trying to maintain American neutrality. He was round-shouldered from a life spent bending over a desk with an underexposed complexion, as one of his colleagues described him. For years, the Japanese had been warning that the presence of American pilots in China could spark a war, and in August 1937 things seemed to boil over as reports circulated that some thousand mercenary pilots were heading to China from the United States. Foreign Minister Koki Hirota gave a speech pushing for the United States to crack down on these renegade pilots. Of course, the men in question were former military pilots, but that distinction didn't matter to the Japanese. Secretary of State Cordell Hull, also trying to keep the United States out of this war, had the State Department issue a memo titled American Citizens Engaging in Military Activities in China, Prohibition of, warning that Americans fighting for China could be prosecuted. To control the scale of the problem, the State Department limited the number of passports for travel to China. When a passport was issued, it came with a new restriction. This passport is not valid for travel to or in any foreign state in connection with entrance into or service in foreign military or naval forces. The mercenary pilots the press had been talking about never showed up. Cheneau received direct warnings from Gauss, who threatened to have him arrested and also intimated a court-martial and loss of citizenship were in store for me. What Cheneau and his men had believed would be a relatively brief Asian sojourn now looked as if it could land them behind bars. Fifteen of the civilian pilots with the China National Aviation Corporation decided to leave. An official with the airline explained that they wanted to avoid any action that could compromise United States neutrality. Luke Williamson left to become a pilot for Delta Airlines. Cheneau still felt the pull of duty to remain in China and fight, but was it worth the risk? What if he wasn't able to return to his home and family? In quiet moments when he was alone at night, he was filled with a longing for home. He wrote to a friend, though so far away, I felt again the soft, cool night air of Louisiana and its stillness and serenity. Whenever he received a letter from Nell, he would eagerly read the updates and then brag about his son's accomplishments, baseball progress, motorcycle maintenance, but nostalgia was no match for his sense of destiny. As he wrote in his diary, all Americans ordered to evacuate. Guess I am Chinese. Cheneau had undergone a remarkable transformation in these few months in China, for he now felt empowered as a leader and trusted as an airman. Even though he was working for a foreign country, this was his battle. All my life I had been fighting every fight to the finish, he later wrote, and I knew I would have to see this one through. Aware that questions would be raised in the United States about his being in China, he wrote a letter that would be published in the Montgomery Advertiser, offering no indication of regret for his actions and explaining that China was fighting the war of all the Pacific nations. By the late fall of 1937, Nanking's air defence had all but vanished. The Imperial Japanese Army took Shanghai and moved toward Nanking, overrunning Chinese outposts along the way. Soldiers who tried to surrender were executed, a prelude to what was to come. The nationalist Chinese army braced for the assault. Troops dug in behind the city's wall, behind minefields, walls of sandbags and rows of barbed wire. You're being watched by the entire nation, indeed by the entire world, Chiang Kai-shek told his generals. We cannot abandon Nanking. But that was precisely what the city's civilian population was doing. Rickshaws and automobiles were piled high with packing crates, bundles, furniture and humanity, a European journalist wrote. It was impossible to find packing crates or brown paper anywhere. The shops were all sold out. Eventually, Chiang determined that he too would have to evacuate and told Cheneau to do the same before the city fell. The Chiangs fled the doomed city on December 7th. A few weeks earlier, just before Thanksgiving, American diplomats had reached out to Chenault and his crew, inviting them to a dinner hosted by Clarence Gauss at the American embassy in Nanking. 
The officials apologised more or less for their earlier actions in ordering Americans to depart China, C.B. Smith wrote, and assured Cheno that they wanted to help him. An American Navy ship, the USS Panay, was docked in the Yangtze River and would offer Chenault and his men safe passage out of the city. On December 2, the embassy issued a final warning to all Americans that they should withdraw from Nanking as soon as possible, and told them that if they didn't seek refuge on the Panay, their escape might be impossible. As the city descended into chaos, a handful of American journalists packed their bags, piled into a Chevy truck, and made their way down to the Panay. The evacuation felt like a defeat to men like Norm Alley, a cameraman whose creed was go to hell if you must, but bring back pictures of it. Before dawn on December 4th, Cheneau drove out to the airfield with a few remaining Americans, including Sebi Smith. The burning oil depots illuminated the dark sky, and machine gun fire was too close for comfort. Smith was able to hitch a ride in one of the last Boeing transports to leave Nanking, but Cheneau wanted to depart in his own plane, the Hawk 75. I taxied out to the end of the runway in the dark and waited with engine idling and hand on throttle for the first faint streaks of dawn to break over the city wall and light my takeoff, he later wrote. As the sun began to rise, he could see enough of the runway, littered with bomb craters, to take off. He rose over the city one final time, and as he looked back, the rising sun cast a pink glow over the stricken city, which gradually changed to a prophetic bloody red. When Nanking fell into the hands of the Japanese, the occupying forces dispatched barbaric cruelties on the city's residents, as Tillman Durdin, the New York Times correspondent who stayed behind, described the ensuing bloodshed. Japanese soldiers went house to house taking whatever they pleased, including the bodies of the Chinese women. Minnie Vautrin, an American missionary teacher at Ginling College, a small Christian school for women, opened the gates of the school and allowed an estimated 10,000 women to fill its small campus. She was hoping to shield them from the horror that was unfolding in the streets. When the Japanese soldiers demanded that she unlock a door to a building where women were hiding, she refused. A soldier slapped her in the face, but she didn't back down. She wrote in her diary, I have heard scores of heartbreaking stories of girls who were taken from their homes. The night was filled with horrible screams. Tonight a truck passed in which there were eight or ten girls, and as it passed they called out, Ju Ming, Ju Ming, save our lives, O oh God, control the cruel beastliness of the soldiers in Nanking tonight. The Japanese soldiers soon broke through the locked doors into the college. The most appalling horrors of what is known as the Nanjing Massacre involved what Iris Chang called assault and torture. Women weren't the only victims, but Japanese soldiers tortured the men. John Rabe, a German industrialist with the Siemens Corporation and member of the German Authoritarian Party, was horrified by what he witnessed. Germany was not yet formally allied with Japan, and in fact had been trying to maintain some balance in its relations with Japan and China. During the aerial bombardments, Rabe had put out a massive German authoritarian flag on his property to warn the Japanese bombers to stay away, and he allowed Chinese civilians to seek refuge on his land. As the Japanese rampaged through the city, Rabe put on his German authoritarian armband and tried to patrol the streets, shouting at a Japanese soldier he saw assaulting a young woman. He wrote a scathing report to Hitler, denouncing the atrocities committed by the Japanese soldiers, saying I saw the victims with my own eyes. A few days after the occupation began, the remaining American journalists acknowledged that the time had come to flee. Tillman Durdin was boarding a boat to Shanghai when he saw some 200 Chinese men being held by Japanese soldiers. As he would write in the New York Times, he looked on in horror as the men were lined against a wall and shot. Then a number of Japanese, armed with pistols, trod nonchalantly around the crumpled bodies, pumping bullets into any that were still kicking. It turned out that Chenault was fortunate to not seek refuge aboard the Panay. On December 12, Japanese warplanes attacked the ship, killing three Americans and wounding more than 40. For a moment, it seemed like the type of international incident that could lead to a conflict. Americans, including President Roosevelt himself, were outraged about the attack, but Japanese officials issued an apology and paid an indemnity. They claimed their pilots hadn't seen the ship's American flags. After the loss of Nanking, 
Chiang Kai-shek struck a defiant tone. We may have suffered defeats on the battlefield, but that doesn't mean that the war is over. A new capital was established in Hankou, modern-day Hankou, 400 miles up the Yangtze River. A port town that had hosted foreign military ships, its foreign concessions gave the city a European flair. To foreigners, Hankou was known as the Chicago of China because of its incredible industrial production. Arriving in the dead of winter, Chenault had to contend with worsening bronchitis, a seemingly annual malady he suffered, for which he drank cod liver oil to help soothe the inflammation. Hankou was preparing to become the next battleground, and the mission to defend it was an international effort. It included a group of German advisers who had been helping Chiang for years, led by Alexander von Falkenhausen, a lanky 60-year-old general who could often be seen wearing a suit and fedora as he walked